Hey guys. So, a couple months ago, I made a video that a lot of people had been asking me to make for a very long time. A review of the Channel Awesome movie, To Boldly Flee. Now, one of the most notable things about the video is that it is exceptionally long. I think it ended up being about an hour and 45 minutes. And the reason it's that long is that it's secretly two videos uploaded as one. Part one, the review, which everyone had been asking me to make, and part two, the really weird bit that goes on for a really long time that I made exclusively for myself. For a while during production, I questioned if I needed to actually split to boldly suck into two separate videos, but I realized the only reason I had been truly motivated to make the video was the idea of these two different aspects coexisting. I view the second part of the video to be this cathartic wind-down that really helps complement the first, and of course, without the first part, the second part just, just wouldn't make sense, it wouldn't exist. But I still totally understand the imposing nature of this hour and 45 minute thing. And as time went by, I started to notice little editing errors, things not being mixed quite right, bits of audio being missing, you know, but stuff that I wouldn't have had time to notice or fix at the original time of posting just because it was such a massive project. So today I'm going to be releasing a sort of special edition of the original video with all the errors fixed and split into two bite-sized portions. I'm fully aware that the review portion is probably going to perform pretty well and the second half that I'm going to upload is going to be watched by absolutely no one. Uh, I guess as time has gone on, I I've grown to accept that that's okay, considering everything. This project turned out to be a sort of a retrospective on all of the content that I've produced for YouTube, going back all the way to Quinn and Leap in 2013, so I think it's kind of a neat way to end out the decade by looking back on all that stuff, and I hope you guys agree. With that, let's jump back in time. So, let's talk about lore movies. Whenever I begin discussing this topic with my friends, they're often confused and ask me to give a definition of what the term lore movie even means. To me, a lore movie is a film or project which is so wholly based on playing fan service to previously existing stories that it isn't made with the same standards or purposes of a regular film. Now this video is focusing on examples on the internet, but really these sorts of media can exist in mainstream cultures as well. I think one of the best examples of this is Psych the Movie. The film, a long-awaited sequel to the cult TV series still beloved by many to this day, was rushed into production after extremely fast rewrites had to be made due to the health of one of the show's main actors. This leads to a story which is as contrived as it is forgettable. Coming from a show that is known for being one of the most creative takes on its genre and format, it feels a little sad to see the plot be given a treatment that feels more akin to something like CSI Miami. Despite this, I still thoroughly enjoy Psych the Movie, because it still delivers on everything that's important. I tuned in to see all of my favorite characters again, to have cameos for all the fan favorites, and to have classic nods to funny moments from the past. And it pulled that off. It accommodated the franchise's lore to the extent that it not being a good movie really didn't matter to me. And that, in my eyes, is what a lore movie is. It's media meant to subsist off existing material, no matter how obscure, in order to cater to a pre-existing group of hyperfans to the extent that more general quality isn't the first thing considered. One of the first YouTube movies I think of when it comes to this term is Dick Figures the Movie. Now, I remember watching a lot of Dick Figures and being really excited when they ended up crowdfunding this big professional film. But by the time it was released, I had stopped watching and had literally forgotten everything about the show. Mainly because it's called Dick Figures. So it's a trip watching this movie now and seeing all these characters who don't deserve to have a film made about them be introduced explicitly because they're recognizable for hardcore fans. 
There's this raccoon in the film who is very important to the narrative. And I feel like if I remembered anything about this show, him getting an entire film with big character payoff would be a big deal. But to get enjoyment that deep, I already need to be some sort of hyper fan. Thus, lore movie. I oh so wanted to beat around the bush for this video. Maybe I'd find a couple other YouTuber lore movies to critique. Maybe one in particular would be good and I'd get to praise it. But why waste your time? We all know why we're here. Channel Awesome is a name that is so entwined with the mistreatment of friends and co-workers and mismanagement on a ridiculous scale that even just saying their name tends to suck all of the fun out of the room. Now, the channel that probably shouldn't be named actually used to have somewhat of a positive reputation. Indeed, I remember when I was a kid, uh, absolutely loving watching Nostalgia Critic videos. I would do it every Wednesday like clockwork, and I was so obsessed with it that if you knew me at the time, you probably can remember either a time where I tried to make you watch one of these videos, or where I talked about it to an extent that probably got kind of grating. As I grew older, and I got through middle school and then high school, I, uh, I slowly stopped watching them, and it's, it's mainly because I just uh, started liking good content. But even then, I didn't expect all of the things that have come out since then. You know, um, I recently went to a social gathering uh, of sorts, and there was someone there who I'd never met before who knew who I was uh, as a YouTuber. So he, we ended up talking, and it became quickly apparent that he knew me exclusively as a guy who had talked about Channel Awesome uh, a, a while ago <laughs> in one video, and that's all he knew me for. And so he wanted like all my all my hot takes about like he was like, "What do you think of the wall? What do you think of this and that?" And I was like, "Man, you're gonna be surprised by this, but when I don't like a YouTuber, I don't keep watching him." But you know, I had this realization. Not only do I not like. Uh, talking about Channel Awesome. I don't like thinking about Channel Awesome. I prefer to live in a world where they cross my mind so little that I forget that they exist. That tends to be where I'm the most happy. After all that drama came out and I rushed to make that video, there was this brief uh, private time that I had sort of offline where I was really broken by the whole affair. It, I became physically unwell by, because of just of how upset it all made me. And it got to the point that like my friends would like come to the house and would like, like would drag me out and be like, okay, we're taking you to lunch. You shouldn't be alone right now. <laughs> and I think a big part of it was that the Channel Awesome situation made me have like a full on identity crisis where, where I realized if I hadn't grown up watching Duck Blocker's content, I would not have gone down the path that I, that I had. I, I would never have made those early videos talking about Rankin Bass films. I wouldn't have done any of that. I wouldn't have a YouTube channel. I wouldn't have a career. I wouldn't be on this path. And I didn't know how to keep moving forward when I, when I, I just felt those origins had been so sullied, you know? And you know, the sad thing is, Channel Awesome, uh, their whole strategy was just to ignore the situation and wait for people like me to become so emotionally exhausted that we never wanted to talk about it again. They felt if they just never addressed any of the issues, their careers would be fine. And at the end of the day, according to Brad Jones, one of the only people who stuck by them, at the end of the day, their careers were all that really mattered to them in this situation. This thing, and one thing that we kept saying on our site and uh, and other sites as well. It was, it was we were saying like, I mean, look, like Logan Paul filmed a dead body, and like yeah. he still has a career. <laughs> I mean, that is so upsetting to me, because Channel Awesome was essentially exposed for covering up several instances of sexual misconduct and sexual harassment, and all for the sake of protecting their friends and also seemingly their brand. And their only response to this is that they don't really care about that because Logan Paul filmed a dead body and he still makes a lot of money and that's all they really care about is their careers. I mean, I don't know how I can not be upset by that. But I mean, at the same time, their strategy paid off because after a month, I, I, I made like a silent vow to myself. I would never talk about this stuff on the channel ever again because I was just tired of people tagging me in this stuff every day. I just didn't want to hear about it anymore. So what changed? Why am I talking about it now if I felt that way so strongly? 
Well, this little voice kept whispering a thought into my ear, one that made me smile no matter what, and I, I just felt the need to bring it to light. When you hear the name Doug Walker, one of the first things you think is, oh, the Nostalgia Critic, one of the most popular comedic reviewers on the entire internet. I would like to see that change. From now on, when you hear that name, I believe you should think, Doug Walker, the worst filmmaker of all time. If you binge a lot of my old videos, you, you might notice a trend where I used to always come on camera and say, wow guys, I think I found the worst movie of all time. I know I said this a month ago, but this one's really the worst. Uh, and you may have noticed I have not done that in a very long while. And that is because about a year and a half ago, I watched To Boldly Flee, which is the worst film of all time. There's no competition, no questions anyone could ask. It, it is legitimately the most frustratingly unentertaining, unwatchable movie ever made by human hands. Now, Quentin, I hear you protest. Surely there are worse movies than that? Birdemic, The Room, Manos, Plan 9, etc. And to that I say, all of those movies are incredible. I have had parties where I invite friends over and we put those movies on and we watch them and we have a great time. How can you say those movies are truly bad when everyone loves them so much? To Boldly Flee isn't like that. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable. It's, it's, it's sort of bad that, that crushes your soul, that, that makes you want to turn it off every frame that goes by. Uh, I, uh, this video hurt to make. I was in pain during this video. I, I barely could handle it. And I just hope to God it doesn't hurt as much to watch. One of the things that's most frustrating about To Boldly Flee is that it isn't really cohesive in all of the things it presents. There's a lot of stuff that deserves deep dives and deconstructions, but not a lot of it is really connected. One plotline has nothing to do with another, it's just a lot of stuff that's all going on, and a lot of it really deserves to be talked about on its own. Most of my videos are structured to be a series of rants and mini discussions which build up to a bigger picture, but in this case, the only bigger picture is that it's really hard to understand why someone made this movie. And so, before we get into a long-winded exploration of the many unlinked threads of this project, we might as well start off this discussion by giving a big thanks to the sponsor of today's long overdue review, NordVPN. NordVPN is a service that helps cloak the location of your IP address by giving you access to thousands of secure servers all over the world. Being online in today's day and age can be very dangerous, and online security is something that you have to start taking very seriously before something bad happens. Nord not only makes you more secure, but gives you a chance to get around any copyright or censorship issues in your country. If you're visiting China and really want to binge a season of South Park or the latest Winnie the Pooh movie, NordVPN can help. And you can get 80 1% off of a three-year plan today with four additional months and a full subscription to Nord Plus if you go to nordvpn.com slash Quentin right now. Once again, that's nordvpn.com slash Q-U-I-N-T-O-N. So to really understand a big chunk of the point to To Boldly Flee, we need to understand what the Nostalgia Critic had been up to up to this point and what struggles he had gone up against. Doug Walker started his review series as a side project while he worked his day job. It was created on no budget and was formed for the early limitations of old YouTube. Most of his early content is under 10 minutes, because for the time, all YouTube videos had to be. And because of this, he was initially very sparing with what he would show and discuss. Most videos would go like this. Doug would find something he was nostalgic for, he would talk about the experience he had with it as a child, and then he would go through it and talk about how silly or stupid it was, while playing clips that were worthy of being quickly mocked. I think early Nostalgia Critic can be a lot more palatable because Flanderization effect hadn't quite set in yet, so the punchline to every joke isn't just him screaming, and he manages to have actual commentary on what he's watching, and more importantly, why he's watching it. Doug soon left YouTube in favor of competitor Blip.tv and started his own website, ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com. This granted him the right to make his videos as long as possible and to include as much of the copyrighted material as he saw fit, and he also began inviting other similar creators on board to broaden the site's appeal. Soon, the brand lasted long enough to celebrate anniversaries, and to reward the fans for sticking around so long, films began to be made starring the most popular and iconic reviewers of the time. All you need to know about these movies is that they're bad, 
but not as bad as the movie we're going to be reviewing today. I think whenever Doug isn't in the scene, it's just a bunch of friends hanging out and trying to capture a feeling of camaraderie and respect, you sort of nod your head and find yourself understanding why people like sitting through these things even though they were kind of embarrassing. One really important moment in Doug's devolution was his massive review of Moulin Rouge. The video is a musical. It features a couple reviewers singing and acting next to him. Some of them seem like they're being held against their will. And even as a nostalgia critic obsessed tween, I sort of understood that what I was watching was really embarrassing and significantly worse than the movie they were talking about. And yet, I was shocked to learn later that this was the review that made Doug decide to stop being the nostalgia critic. Not because it's one of the cringiest things ever to be made, but because he considered it to be a work so great that he could never top it again if he ever tried. Boy, did he prove that wrong. This brings us, the long way round, to his most infamous creation. To boldly flee. The inspiration behind this movie is essentially a desire to justify the fact that Doug Walker's creations are inherently bad. And not even by regular standards that an actual film student might apply, but to his own limited pitching and perceptions of what makes a movie good or bad in his own reviews. His films can be nitpicked very easily. Their stories often don't make logical sense and are filled with the proverbial plot hole. There's a rip in space time outside of the Earth that's making my movies bad! In this film, Doug and his cast introduce us to the plot hole, an anomaly in space that is affecting the nature of reality to the extent that it makes these movies not make any goddamn sense. In the previous film, the gag character Mati had sacrificed his life and had passed away, and the critic spends the start of To Boldly Flee mourning his friend, before discovering that he survives inside of the plot hole. Okay, so as you can probably tell just by these last few paragraphs, the weirdest thing about this movie is how oddly contained and esoteric it is. Understanding the long and ridiculous plot involves not only having a grasp of all of the previous Channel Awesome lore movies, but also a surprisingly high amount of Doug Walker's content. You know that thing MST3K does, where most of the episode will be them riffing a movie in the theater, but then it'll pan out and suddenly the characters will be acting as if they're in the movie in order to lampoon and make commentary on it? Well, Doug Walker usually does the same thing on his show, except he's so immersed in his character that there's this expectation of some reality behind the segments. As if all of these things are really happening to this character. As an example, the infamously bad movie Battlefield Earth features an ending where the heroes of the film teleport a bomb to the homeworld of the alien bad guys, and it destroys all life on the planet due to its heavily gas-based atmosphere. So when Doug reviewed the film, he had a skit where the same alien bad guy contacts the critic from said planet, and then someone lights a cigarette in the background, and the entire thing blows up. Uh-oh. What's wrong? Oh, it looked like someone lit a cigarette on our home planet, and now the whole damn thing's going to explode. Oh, gee, I'm sorry. It's a dumb skit, pretty easy to forget by virtue of not being very clever, and yet, if you haven't seen that review, you will be immensely confused by To Boldly Flee, because that character from that one skit at the end of that one review is an essential plot point for the entire runtime. Except it doesn't even make sense how they present it, because it seems like Doug doesn't remember the content of his own videos very well, so he keeps describing that skit in a way that it distinctly did not happen. Roll the footage! Not only is he responsible for the destruction of my home planet- Doug straight up just steals characters from other films, and his only justification over why he should be allowed to do this is that he made fun of these characters in his videos. Like, General Zod is in this movie. It's Doug playing General Zod, but it's literally General Zod. And there's not really a bit or a point. It's like General Zod being there is the entire joke. And he doesn't have anything else to add, really. My favorite part is that Doug seemed to be aware that he couldn't just literally steal these characters and get away with it. So his choice was to change the spelling of the names just enough that it was different, but not enough that they're pronounced differently. So he just added another D to General Zod, and he called it a new character. 
Fair use, everybody. You know that scene in Ghostbusters where two characters are talking and one of them uses like a Twinkie to explain some science and then a third character walks in and the second character goes, Tell him about the Twinkie. Uh, in this movie they do that joke, but it's about Sage's penis instead. That's the movie. That's That's all you need to know about it. It's really fantastic scenes you've seen done well in good movies, but rewritten to be about the genitalia of internet reviewers. One of the biggest plot points in To Boldly Flee is that... Star Wars is happening? I don't know how else to explain it. Doug lifts numerous scenes from Star Wars, he has random reviewers act them out, and it's sometimes line by line except there are new punchlines added in. It's sort of like what Robot Chicken did with their Star Wars specials except without any of the charm or production value, uh, but more importantly, those skits were really compact. They didn't go on for like three fucking hours. This isn't a small thing. Star Wars happening is most of the film, and it's the least interesting aspect, but arguably, it's also what makes it so bad. Because not only are you seeing Doug and Rob perform in ways that aren't entertaining, but you're also seeing their friends acting these moments out and trying their best to slug through it in spite of their obvious embarrassment. And I want to tell you that there's some point to the Emperor from Star Wars being one of the big bad guys and bossing around characters from Superman 2 and Battlefield Earth, but there is no real point other than it being throwbacks to skits that I honestly just don't remember. I guess Doug really wanted to milk how much he looks like Terrence Stamp, but I look like Jack O'Halloran and you don't see me making a non-standalone movie. One of the strangest scenes, I feel, is the parody of the opera scene from Star Wars 3 where Palpatine tells Anakin about Darth Plagueis the Wise. In this movie, they're watching Manos the Hands of Fate, and Palpatine is essentially pitching my opinion that it's actually really great because it's entertaining and people love watching it. And he suddenly claims that the one way to make a great film that will last for all of time is to make one that is extraordinarily terrible. People love him precisely because they hate him. I don't understand. Fame is fleeting, but infamy lasts forever. It's a technique only a true master can perfect. And I can learn this technique? <laughs> Not from a critic. There's this film on Netflix called Frankenstein's Monsters Monster Frankenstein, which is about this actor finding one of his father's lost plays and making a miniature documentary on it. And of course, the footage from the play is all fake and is supposed to be awkwardly bad in a really sort of funny way. I'm bringing this up because I feel that the highlight of the film is how pretentiously several characters in the story will begin long conceded monologues about what it means to be an actor, despite it having nothing to do with the scene. A performer who showcases his talent is no better than a rich man boasting about his billfold. An actor shouldn't glide across the stage more gracefully than a common man, nor should he play the clown, a studied simplicity in every gesture. I, I can't tell what's a quote. Beware. In To Boldly Flee, the characters talk about being reviewers in the exact same manner, and it feels totally irrelevant to the situations that they're in, but whoever is writing feels like talking about being a reviewer adds something when it absolutely does not. The character in the story who is given the task of being Luke Skywalker is pushed through this arc where other reviewers try and teach her what it means to be a critic. And it's just really bad. According to what I've been told, the script for To Boldly Flee didn't actually include what films the scenes were copying. So a lot of these actors actually shot these scenes without understanding the references that they were supposed to be making, which obviously makes the parody work a whole lot less. The most embarrassing part about these long portions of script is just how much they do depend on the secondary cast, and how uncomfortable said people end up looking throughout the entire production. As you can probably tell, I'm trying not to show many of these characters for various reasons. So instead, let's go back to making fun of the scenes with Brad, cause that guy sucks. Oh my god, this is so bad. I remember watching episode 3 and seeing the scene they're making fun of and just thinking, wow, this could not have been directed more poorly, but I was wrong. I was dead wrong, because look what we got here. I've been informed that Brad specifically hated always being called Bradikin in the script, and that when people started calling him that in the fandom, he got really upset, going as far as to ask that references to this be removed from the IMDb page. 
So, Bradikin is now what I'm going to call him for the rest of time. The scene where Palpatine claims to Bradikin that making bad movies is the greatest way to be known, and that making a bad film on purpose actually causes one to live forever in infamy, is something that really caught my interest when he first said it. Because while intended to be a parody of big shot Hollywood thinking, it accidentally becomes a parody of how the filmmakers approach this project. I mentioned earlier that the plot hole mainly exists as an explanation for why these movies are bad, and that is absolutely accurate, based not only on how it's presented through dialogue, but also stories that happen to be going on behind the scenes. Rob specifically would use it as a way to shut down the cast and crew, pointing out blatant disregard for the basic tenets of filmmaking. Rule of 180 being broken? Plot hole. Continuity of scenes being largely inconsistent from shot to shot? Plot hole. The literal definition of the term plot hole not applying to half of these problems? That's gonna be a plot hole. This Palpatine character is a perfect representation of how shoddy the messaging of this film really ends up being, because depending on what scene you're watching, he's either a metaphor for scummy producers in Hollywood and also the existence of copyright law, or he's an evil emperor who built a gigantic space station that can blow up a bunch of stuff that he wants to use to rule the galaxy. By the way, this video is unofficially an episode of Knock Off November, and it might actually be the final Knock Off November, because I am officially out of ideas for this series. But that might be fitting, because out of all of my years of watching knockoff movies, I have never seen one fly so close to the source material, and it gets away with this by claiming that it's all a parody. But again, and I cannot emphasize this enough, I do not get the joke. It seems like the joke is supposed to be that the source material is being copied, as if that by itself is funny. This can be most easily compared to the likes of Epic Movie and Disaster Movie. But I feel like as bad as those movies were, they at least succeeded in finding interesting ways to lampoon whatever they were discussing. The same can absolutely never be said of To Boldly Flee. When you get down to it, this style of content, where the reference is the entire joke, has sort of been the bare-bones basics to a lot of Doug Walker's material for a very long time. Here's a clip from one of his recent videos. Let's get this podcast with sketches started. I assume you want to talk about my impact on R-rated comic book movies, box office growth, and groundbreaking fourth wall humor in the same sentence? Not so fast, dumb devil. I got a black Morty from another dimension. I'm the woke version. Hey, oh, we gotta go in space, but I'm under house arrest for being a copyright martyr. Good thing we got it. We got a space house, we, we got a space house, people! So the Nostalgia Critic enters the plot hole space thing in his space car, and the moment he enters, he realizes that he's back in his own home. At first he chastises, I think, God for being so predictable, before he opens his laptop and sees a script. A script to his own movie, written by another version of himself. Oh my god. So the reason that I've been going out of my way to define the Nostalgia Critic as a character is that it's actually the aspect that the creators would probably most easily identify as a defining factor. The Critic is a character written by many men who is simply acted out by Doug like a marionette. I would argue one of the main reasons that they stuck so closely to this style is that it was a really good defense whenever they stepped over the line in terms of writing, but to be fair, Pretty much most internet reviewers at the time really stuck pretty close to this shtick. At the time, most of these creators totally fed into the idea pitched by these movies, that all of their reviews existed within a cinematic universe, where Lankara was running around with a spaceship, the original Spoonie was killed and replaced by a clone, and yes, a plot hole is threatening to consume the universe. I remember many reviewers built up to this event. This was their Crisis on Infinite Earths. And people like Doug Walker started to take this idea very seriously, to the extent that he started to do unironic analysis of the critics' actions within the evolution of his reviews. This all leads us to the big reveal of To Boldly Flee. This scene which could not have been more bizarre or heavy-handed. I have so many questions about this scene, but strangely enough, I think the first one is, what in the world made Doug Walker choose brushing his teeth as the activity he would do 
as he entered his living room. What made him choose that specific thing as the thing he would naturally be doing? Does Doug Walker do this? Does he pace around his house while he brushes his teeth? Is this how he thinks? How he contemplates? Was this entire movie crafted over a flossing session? I cannot emphasize enough how often I think about this scene. In my eyes, this is the most memorable thing about this movie. That Doug Walker walks around his house, casually brushing his teeth in the middle of the goddamn day. Nothing else is worth talking about. This scene keeps me up at night. Who are you? <clears throat> I, I, I'm the writer. So I'm just a character? If you watch a lot of Doug Walker's emotional videos like this one, one writing trope keeps rearing its ugly head. That being, Doug will introduce gag characters who are meant not to be taken seriously, and will then have them go through serious emotions, all while pointing out how spectacular it is that all of this has happened. If you're in the ninth grade, this comes across as brilliant and unexpected, and if you're any other age, it seems charmless and shallow, a fact best represented by how the characters have to analyze stories out loud for any of this to be apparent. And so the ultimate twist of To Boldly Flee is that the nostalgia critic, despite being someone who is meant to be a caricature of mean, annoying people, actually occasionally acts with some sense of morality. This is what Doug calls development. Would the dictator from Kick Assia actually give a shit about his friends? Would the money-grubbing egomaniac from Suburbanites actually give a crap about a dead Indian boy? People who are consistently emotionally abusive to almost everyone around them are redeemable if they occasionally seem like they care about their friends. I know I've been analyzing this movie in an odd, non-linear order, perhaps as a sort of rebellion against the style of videos made by the man himself, but you have to keep in mind that in between scenes of Doug Walker telling himself that his writing is brilliant because the critic cares about his friends, we keep cutting to ridiculously unentertaining scenes that are the pinnacle of embarrassment, all starring Doug's friends who clearly seem like they don't want to be there. Oh wow, it's the throne room scene from Star Wars, but with really lame jokes. Come on, kid. Some films are worth fighting for. So I know I joined the Empire and betrayed my friends and nearly helped kill all life in the galaxy, but the one thing I kept thinking throughout this whole thing was... Logan Paul filmed a dead body and he still has a career. It's up to you, Critic. The world of endless possibilities, the great mystery? Who do you think that the is? World where you know you have meaning. This guy. Just walking by on the sidewalk outside of Doug Walker's home. What's his story? How did his day go? The overall intention of To Boldly Flee is that it is a swan song for Doug Walker and his creation. As I mentioned before, he had recently realized that his reviews had peaked, and that he no longer found satisfaction making them. His plan was to move on to another field of creation, comedy skits. He would soon fail miserably at this, his popularity and his sight would tank and fail, and he would put the tie back on begrudgingly, under the understanding that it was his only option for longevity. So what are you waiting for? Hmm? You know it's just a matter of time. But at the time that Taboldi Flea was created and released, this was it. This was the final piece of media that would ever feature the critic. At the climax of the film, with a plot holes about to destroy everything, the critic invites the galaxy to join him in pointing out plot holes in famous films, as he allows the whole to absorb the universe, and then, himself. He becomes the world, becomes the universe, becomes the plot hole, and allows the plot hole to become all of reality. Doug Walker is now God. The final scene has a discussion where Santa Christ meets with all the critics who have suddenly survived and says that the universe exists within a plot hole now, so plot holes no longer really matter. Oh, innocent, innocent Santa Christ. Plot holes never mattered. There's this ongoing thread throughout the movie where characters keep saying like slight variations of a similar phrase, and it's something like, this is the end. 
to a golden age of reviews. And that certainly seems to imply an undeniable ego to Doug, or perhaps his vision of the critic, or perhaps his worth through the critic? I I'm not too sure. I feel like if I were to quit YouTube and I were to release this gigantic movie claiming that me leaving YouTube was the end to the golden age of all YouTube content, you guys would start retroactively liking my content less. <laughs> the sex doll analysis was the peak of all YouTube content. It is all downhill from there. It's no wonder that the creators on ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com started to feel like it was less a network being supported by the big guys and more Doug Walker at center stage and the rest of them just serving as decorations around him. And by the way, almost everyone in the movie found out that the Nostalgia Critic was going to die and that he was going to stop making reviews when they read the script. A script which implied that when he left, they were going with him. You know, I I wrote 18 pages of analysis for this, and I've, I've been editing it while I've been shooting. And while I was editing, I just realized there are so many, like, storylines I just never touched because they're they're not interesting. And mainly they're the secondary cast just being, like, really embarrassed, and I just didn't feel like touching it. There's a storyline where Mechakara is trying to, like, get into the ranks, and, and he's turning some of the reviewers into, like, famous cyborgs that Doug Walker has stolen from other properties, and it's just so bad. There's a subplot where they go inside Spoonie's mind, and and Spoonie, um, they, they see versions of themselves how Spoonie perceives them, which I think is funny, because I imagine that's what reading the script for the first time was like, except it's, Doug, it's Doug's mind. Uh, you know, you're just like, oh, man, Doug really thinks I'm a, I'm really whiny. Okay, I've avoided talking about it long enough. Let's talk about the key aspect of what makes this film so infamous. The haphazard production! Earlier this year, I released a video that was a big deal for me because I had worked on it for literally over two years. And what, what the video was, it was an April Fool's video, and in 2017, I had this idea where every time I would shoot a video, I'd shoot like a gag version that was like sort of like an alternate world. And I'm still not happy with a lot of it because I had to rush it to get it out when I wanted to get it out, and I feel like I could have done a lot of those segments better. And in total, the video ended up being three hours and 24 minutes, which is long, and it's no wonder I had to rush a lot of segments despite having two years to make it. Uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is To Boldly Flee is four minutes longer than that, and it was made in a week. This movie is longer than Endgame, and it was made in less time than I spent working on this review. There's one set of shots in this movie that I think are all really, really telling. Doug and a bunch of other characters are in the foreground talking about something, honestly, who cares? And in the background, Phalus is there. And Phalus, it seems has been directed to stand in shot and mess with the house spaceship controls and pretend like he's doing something important as background filler. And he seems very exhausted and is moving in the most passive aggressive way you can imagine, making it as clear as possible that he does not want to be in this movie. This is the greatest performance of To Boldly Flee. It is the one true time that the emotions of the actor come across as they are intended, where you are told everything you need to know about the project. Another great moment is the final party scene, where all of the critics are hanging out and having fun, including our dear friend Bradikin, except for Phelan, who just doesn't move the entire- The cinematography in this film is so awkward, so rushed. It really comes across as the sort of work you get when you expect to film a three and a half hour film in seven days. There's so many low angles of Doug for no reason. I remember when I shot one of my first films in high school and my friends had to sit me down and explain to me that movies aren't supposed to be filmed like this. I watched a brief podcast clip done by a bunch of smaller creators last year and they all started reviewing the document and talking about it. And suddenly one of them invited their mom over from the hallway and it turned out that she is some sort of industry professional. And they told her about the 18 hour shooting days and her perspective on the situation was actually really enlightening. She basically said, when you shoot a movie and produce it like these people did, you either use industry professionals or your friends. You can't use professionals because they'll say no because the final product will be very bad and they won't learn anything. And you can't use your friends because when the film is over, they won't be your friends anymore. There's this really funny meta element to this movie 
where the movie was written under the pretense that Doug Walker was popular and friends with all the people in the movie, but he's playing a character who is a jerk and is hated by all of them. So everyone in the movie hates him, and they don't want to be around him. But by the end of production, or at least their relationships with him, they all really would hate him. Maybe not because he was a jerk, but at least because he was too stupid to treat them the way that they deserved. A lot of these scenes really do end up taking an entirely different meaning once you look at them under a modern glaze. Well, it's just that whenever you contact one of your reviewers, it's either to criticize them or to fire them. Please don't fire me, Mr. Critic! No, no, I mean, everything I do seems to have a negative impact on somebody. I Fame is fleeting, but infamy lasts forever. So I want to end this video on what is, I think, a pretty unusual note. I want to discuss Doug Walker not as a person I dislike, but as a reflection of what I don't like about myself. As most of you probably know, I used to be this guy who was known for making one specific style of video. I would hop in front of the camera and be all full of energy and I'd be like, guys, I found the worst movie of all time and I wanna tell you guys about it and why it's bad. What kind of various strategies could we, could we choose from to approach explaining to you what makes it so bad? What about this one? What if I explain the plot to you really slowly? And sometimes I make jokes. And a lot of people really enjoyed when I made those sorts of videos and I had a lot of fun making them. You know, sometimes I'd be representing my real views and sometimes I would just be totally going off the cuff and exaggerating for the sake of making the video funnier. And that was just the nature of the game as I understood it. But then the change the channel controversy happened and it got very dark and very upsetting very quickly, and I, I suddenly found it harder to go back to that old standard. And, you know, I still did for a while because I didn't know what else to do. I had a, I had a career. I had, I had to put something out. And, you know, but I just ended up feeling empty every time I was done doing it. Sometimes I'll get curious, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go back through my old catalog, and I'll pop on one of my old videos, and some of them I think are alright. I really like the Fairly Odd Parents video. But other videos are really painful, either because they like lack all self-awareness, or because they're just too much like a Channel Awesome segment, you know, you know, hyper obsessed in all the wrong ways and, and forcing anger about a topic which I I really didn't care as much about as I was pretending to. You know, you know, it's the smallest little things that get to me. In, in my second video, uh, we introduced this character who was just supposed to be like this big vague evil guy that I wanted to show off every you know every once in a while. And we threw on whatever we had around the house. This was back when uh, I would hire people if they already had the costumes for the part. <laughs> like, that's how little budget I had. And I found, I remembered I had some of those, like, spinny goggles and Sam would wear. And it was at a time where I wasn't really watching any of those creators, but I still, like, I still was like, oh, you know, a little nostalgic for that. So I had this, like, scientist character wear these. And, and I really have, I really like that character, but... Just the fact that he looks like Insano makes it so much harder for me to have the same innocent fun we did the first time we used him. I had made the aesthetics of my channel to be sort of a, a lazy copy or perhaps an homage to the works of people like Doug Walker. And when I stopped being able to respect him, I guess I stopped being able to respect myself to some extent. You know, I recently made a little short film. It, uh, it wasn't anything special, it was just like sort of my take on what I thought, what I think Garfield is about. And it was a live action Garfield fan film and I called it Arbuckle. I wanted to do a follow-up video that I had a sponsor for, so I gave myself a very tight deadline. I came across this conundrum where actors kept dropping out left and right like flies. I think I went through like five Limans and everyone, for the most part, was cool. They all had totally legit reasons they couldn't do it. You know, li life happens. And you know, like, I was honestly so, so stressed during this time because I really wanted to pull this off. And you know, when I was in high school and I would make these shoddy films that were just as bad as Tiboldi Fully, but it was excusable because I was, <laughs> I was in like 10th grade. I would make these films and I would do them in almost no time and I would stay up for days and days on end and I would get more stressed every day and I wouldn't get any sleep and one, you know, I'd just snap at some point. But this time I didn't do that. I didn't even come close. I, I didn't push myself nearly that hard because there was this little voice in the back of my head 
you know, whenever I'd get angry that an actor had dropped out or I couldn't meet those deadlines, and that voice would go, hey, you're being a bit of a Doug Walker right now. So I ended up, you know, pushing those deadlines away. They didn't exist anymore. And I, uh, I made filler content to uh, satisfy those sponsors, and everyone hated the filler content, but that's the game you play. And what I realized is Doug Walker isn't just bad, he's this beacon of horribleness where it makes you self-critical in just the right way, where you can become better just by totally avoiding being him. Doug Walker personally ruined an entire subgenre of internet reviewers for me. He ruined the idea of hiding behind a character for every piece you do, of uh, nitpicking films one scene at a time. But worst of all, I feel, he ruined lore movies for me. In a big way, having a channel lore comes across as significantly less charming just because it's sort of associated with Doug Walker's take, which was so without charm or irony. And you know, it's sort of hard for a subgenre not to be defined by the literal worst film of all time existing within its subspace. My biggest aspiration as a creator, perhaps unconsciously, has become to never make any content that even has a slight association with the work of Doug Walker. I don't want my reviews to be like his. I don't want my actions to reflect his. But most importantly, I don't want my filmmaking to even be slightly similar to anything he's ever made. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go brush my teeth. Oh my god! <laughs>